أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل إني نهيت أن أعبد الذين تدعون من دون الله قل لا أتبع أهواءكم قد ضللت إذا وما أنا من المهتدين صدق الله العلي العظيم We've reached ayah number 56 of Surah Al-An'am And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Holy Prophet and he says O Muhammad, say indeed, I have been forbidden to worship those who you invoke besides Allah. The Holy Prophet here is addressing the Meccan idolaters. Say indeed, I have been forbidden to worship those you invoke besides Allah. Say, I will not follow your desires, for I would then have gone astray and I would not be of the rightly guided. In this ayah, after having put forward a series of arguments against the Meccan idolaters, Rasulullah is told to make known his uncompromising rejection of shirk and idolatry of his people, stating that he is forbidden from ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's forbidden from worshipping their idols and their false deities. You find that Tawheed, monotheism, is the cornerstone of every prophetic mission from the time of Adam until the Holy Prophet. The essence of all of these divine messages has been Tawheed. And therefore you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs him that, Ya Rasulullah, you can be accommodating when it comes to other issues. But when it comes to the issue of Tawheed, there is no room for compromise. And if you see that in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inni nuhi, He says, قُلْ إِنِّي نُهِيتُ أَنْ أَعْبُدَ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِ The verb Nuhit is a past tense verb. And the idea is that the Prophet and all Prophets have always been forbidden from following any path that leads to polytheism. That this is an area where no Prophet has ever compromised, the issue of Tawheed. Rasulullah is basically saying that I have been forbidden from invoking anyone other than Allah, for, from invoking anyone other than the Lord of the worlds. I am forbidden from making anything the direction of my life, the object of my love and my awe and my affection other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, I will not achieve the purpose of my creation and that is to move towards spiritual perfection. And the Holy Prophet is also forbidden in this ayah from following the desires and the whims of the Meccans and of the disbelievers. Elsewhere you find in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the Prophet against submitting to the desires and the whims of the disbelievers. If you go, for example, to Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, ayah number 20, and Surah Al-Baqarah, as you know, was revealed in Medina. So the Holy Prophet is living in a city, in a, in a religiously diverse city, where there are Jews, there are Christians, 
there are Muslims, there are perhaps even uh, polytheists who live in the vicinity of the, uh, the city of Mecca. So as you can imagine, when Rasulullah is the head of state, he's naturally going to want to try to make certain accommodations. He's going to try to appease his subjects. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 120 of Surah Al-Baqarah, he reminds the Prophet of a very important reality, especially when you're in a leadership position. He says, وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَا النَّصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ Ya Rasulullah, the Jews and the Christians will never be fully pleased with you until you follow their way, until you become a Jew or until you become a Christian. So do not make your goal the appeasement of these religious minorities. Now you need to protect their rights, you need to guard their, their liberties, but if your goal and your objective is to appease them and please them, it's not going to happen unless you start compromising certain fundamental beliefs. So in this ayah, the Holy Prophet is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make his position very clear that when it comes to the issue of Tawheed, there is no compromise. And if you refer to Surah Al-Kafirun, there was an offer that was made to the Holy Prophet during the Meccan period where the Mushrikeen, they came to Rasulullah and said to the Holy Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, let us come to an agreement. Meet us halfway. One year we will worship Allah, we will worship your Lord, and in the other year you worship the idols. So one year we'll worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the following year we'll conduct rituals and, and, uh, and ceremonies of worship for our idols, and then we will basically dedicate one year to your Lord and then one year to our Lord. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Al-Kafirun. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ And as the ayah continues. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that do not compromise on the issue of Tawheed. And second, do not follow the desires of the people. There are many people who are whispering in your ear, who are pulling you in many different directions. And some of them may even belong to your companions. Do not follow the desires of the people, the whims of the people. Why? What will happen to you if you do so? If you give in? If you start to submit and surrender to the desires of the people around you, you will surely go astray. In fact, even if you look at the word hawa, in the Arabic language, the word hawa means desire. But in classical Arabic, one of the meanings of hawa, as, as described by the Holy Prophet himself in a famous hadith, where the Holy Prophet says, إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ الْهَوَى لِأَنَّهُ يَهْوَى بِصَاحِبِهِ Rasulullah says, the word hawa was called hawa because the word hawa means to overthrow and bring someone down. This is why the Arabs would use the word hawa for desire. Because if someone blindly follows their desires, it will bring about their own destruction. It will bring them down. It will lower them down to a very animalistic level of existence. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 57. قُلْ إِنِّي عَلَىٰ بَيِّنَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّي وَكَذَّبْتُمْ بِهِ مَا عِنْدِي مَا تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ بِهِ إِنْ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ يَقُصُّ الْحَقَّ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الْفَاصِلِينَ Allah says, Say, O Muhammad, Indeed, I am on clear evidence from my Lord. And you have denied him. I do not have that for which you are impatient. The decision is only from Allah. He relates the truth and he is the best 
of deciders. Now, in this ayah, the verse begins where the Prophet is instructed to declare to his community that I am on clear evidence from my Lord. Now, what does the word bayina mean? The Arab linguists, they define bayina as ma yafsulu bayna shay'ain bihayth la yakunu baynahuma tamazuj aw ittisal. Bayina basically means that it means to separate two things in such a way that they become distinct and they're not mixed with each other anymore. So here the Holy Prophet is saying that one of the greatest gifts, one of the greatest blessings that has been bestowed upon me, what gives me the determination and the resilience to start this religious movement and to face all of the adversity is what? Is that I have this bayina. I see the truth very clear. To most people, haq and batil, sometimes it's blurred. We have difficulty sometimes distinguish, distinguishing between right and wrong, differentiating between truth and falsehood. But here the Holy Prophet says, Allah tells the Prophet, tell the people that you cannot sway me. The reason why I don't compromise on tawheed, the reason why I do not give in to your desires is because haq and batil are very clear in my eyes. If the Holy Prophet didn't have this degree of conviction and he, have, and he didn't have this clarity with respect to his own mission, he would be pulled in many different directions. And this statement has been echoed by the prophets of the past. You find even in the Quran, Allah quotes many prophets saying this statement when their people would reject. For example, if you go to Surah Yunus, Surah number 11, verse 28, this is the exact thing that Nuh السلام, said to his community when they would ridicule him, when they would make fun of him. Because when you're, when you're subject to that type of psychological torture and you're abused and you're slandered, it's very easy to become shaken and to give in and to compromise. But you find that Rasulullah and Nabi Nuh as you'll find in this ayah, this bayina that they have, this yateen, this certainty allows them to brush it off. In Surah 11, verse 28, Nuh salam, he says, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُ عَلَى بَيِّنَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّي Oh my people, don't you see I have clear evidence from my Lord that haq is very clear to me. You can insult me, you can ridicule me, you can make fun of me all you want. You can attack me, but that's not going to change the reality that truth and falsehood is very distinguishable in my eyes. So this statement, inni ala bayinatin min rabbi, was made by several prophets in the face of the people's rejection. And it is essentially an assertion of the Prophet's own clarity regarding the truth of the message that he brings. If, if the Prophets had doubt, they wouldn't have this resilience. They wouldn't be able to face the onslaught of physical assault, verbal abuse, and the trials and the tribulations that they faced while propagating their message. And then in the ayah, the Holy Prophet says, ma indi ma bihi. I do not have that for which you are impatient. Now what is this part of the ayah referring to? The Mufassirin of the Holy Quran, they say that the prospect of divine punishment and the resurrection of human beings was constantly denied by the Meccan idolaters. 
Yet the Quran here and in other verses suggests that they seem to want to hasten the punishment. You know, when Rasulullah is preaching and inviting them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the ancient prophets used to invite their communities, there were a group of people within their community who would say that if you're saying, if you're what if what you're saying is indeed the truth, then bring down the punishment. You're saying that. There is divine punishment that we need to beware of Allah's wrath. They would say, bring Allah's wrath. So the Quran suggests that they seem to want to hasten the punishment. Precisely through their obstinate rejection and their insincere questioning and assertions concerning punishment and resurrection. And this is again, subhanAllah, how history repeats itself. They did this with Rasulullah. They would say, Ya Rasulullah, if what you're saying is true, bring down the punishment upon us. And this is the same thing that the community of Nuh would say to Nuh. If you look at, again, Surah Yunus, Surah 11, verse 32, after many, many years of preaching and teaching, the community of Nuh, they say to him, Qalu Ya Nuh, Oh Nuh, you have been debating with us and you have been so you have been so obsessive with how you debate with us and you've you've debated with us so abundantly that we've become fed up. That we're we're tired of hearing these discussions bring down upon us what you are promising if you are indeed truthful so here again the community of another ma'soom they're saying that listen if what you're saying is true bring down allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment but the prophet in this ayah what is he saying that i don't have the ability it's not in my hands to bring to you what you are being impatient about they're being impatient with respect to divine punishment so the prophet is instructed here to make it clear that he possesses no power over the timing of such punishment who decides when punishment descends in al hukmu illa lillah that the decision is only from Allah, it's only with Allah. Now, this phrase in al hukmu illa lillah is a statement that serves as a Quranic basis for the sovereignty of divine rather than human law. That from an Islamic perspective, divine law always supersedes human law. In fact, if you look at Surah An Nisa, Surah number four, verse 65. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here speaks about the spirit of faith, the true spirit of faith. Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Ya Rasulullah, they will not believe, by your Lord, they will not believe, they are not genuine believers until they make you the judge over their disputes. Meaning, if you're truly a mu'min, whenever you have a dispute, whenever you have a quarrel, you direct your dispute to the Holy Prophet and you have him judge. But does it stop there? The ayah continues. تسليما, True faith is not only that Rasulullah resolves your disputes. True faith is that when Rasulullah gives his verdict, which is Allah's hukum, it means that you accept it and there is no internal resistance to his judgment. This is the essence of faith. There are many people, when they are confronted with a divine law, they may submit to it, but what's, what, what happens internally? There is some internal resistance. There is a hidden aversion to that divine law. 
in this ayah, Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ You don't have faith. You don't have real faith unless you make Rasulullah the judge in your disputes and you do not have any internal resistance to his judgment. Meaning that you're pleased with Allah's hukum. You're pleased with divine judgment. Now in this present context, in the ayah that we're looking at, the judgment that belongs to God in this ayah, in this context, refers to the determination of when his punishment will descend. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when individuals or a community is now deserving of punishment. Because only, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in the hearts. He knows if this is an individual or if this is a community that has reached a point that they will not do tawbah. There's no, there's no chance for them to rectify their state. So in this context, the judgment that belongs to God refers to when his punishment will descend. Rasulullah is saying that it's not up to me. I can't snap my finger and make Allah's punishment descend upon you because I don't have knowledge of what is in your hearts unless Allah reveals it to me. Only Allah knows when a community is to be condemned and punished for their transgressions. And then the ayah says, يَقُصُّ الْحَقِّ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الْفَاصِلِينَ Now, يَقُصُّ الْحَقِّ The word يَقُصُّ literally means يَقْطَعُ يَقْطَعُ means to cut something off. So for example, the Arabs would say, that he cut the hair. So qassa literally means to cut something or to sever it. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he is the one, Allah is the one who cuts and severs truth from falsehood. Because in dunya, in this life, the two, some, the two sometimes get mixed. They get mixed in such a way that they appear to be one, or you cannot differentiate between the two. But Allah, through His guidance, by sending us prophets and revelations, He is able to cut truth away from falsehood. He's able to make it distinguishable. يَقُصُّ الْحَقَّ خَيْرُ الْفَاصِلِينَ And Allah is the best deciders. Allah is the best decider when it comes to when to punish when to postpone punishment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every decision that he makes every decree that emanates from him is rooted in unlimited wisdom and it's tempered with mercy so allah is the best of deciders indicates that he will decide between truth and falsehood and between the prophets and those who rejected the messages of the prophets. In the next ayah, Allah says, Qul, say, O Muhammad, لو أن عندي ما تستعجلون به لقضي الأمر بيني وبينكم والله أعلم بالظالمين Say, O Muhammad, if I had that for which you are impatient, the matter would have been decided between me and you. But Allah is the most knowing of the wrongdoers. Now, the attempts of the disbelievers to elicit the timing of divine punishment, because this is essentially what they're asking. You know, when is the punishment going to come? Bring down divine wrath. This is demonstrated by the warning that the Prophet is giving them that were the timing of your punishment in my hands, the matter would have been decided. Meaning Rasulullah is saying that if it was up to me, the punishment would descend upon you now. Now it's interesting here, we know that Rasulullah is what? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The Holy Prophet is a mercy to the world. In this ayah, the Holy Prophet 
is saying that if, if it were up to me, imagine how wicked these people are. Rasulullah, this is in Mecca. Imagine how much suffering he experienced. That in this ayah, Allah is telling him, say to them that if it were up to me, if it were up to the Messenger of Allah, the punishment would have descended upon you. This is the difference between the mercy of Rasulullah and Allah's mercy. The Prophet is merciful, he's compassionate, but there is no mercy that matches divine mercy. This is why we say Allah is what? Arhamur Rahimi. That even the mercy of the Holy Prophet has a limit. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy extends to all things as we recite in Dua Kumail. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasa'at kulla shay. So this is a reminder that the Holy Prophet is merciful, but his mercy cannot be compared to the mercy of the Lord who created him, the Lord of the worlds. So the matter of deciding when punishment will descend, it's not in the Prophet's hand, but it is Allah who decrees the timing of his punishment and its postponement should be seen as an act of divine mercy and wisdom. Then in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُو وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ and with him are the keys of the unseen. None knows them except him. And he knows what is on the land and in the sea. Not a leaf falls, but he knows it. And no grain is there within the darknesses of the earth. And no moist or dry thing, but it is written in a clear record. The word ghayb, al ghayb, when you find al ghayb mentioned in the Quran, it essentially refers to all of the realities that are beyond the reach of ordinary human perception. So ghayb includes Allah, ghayb includes people's inner thoughts, the inner thoughts of others, the intentions of others. We don't have access to that knowledge. The angelic realm is also ghayb. Akhirah is ghayb. Paradise, hellfire, qiyama. All of these realities are within the scope of al-ghayb. The soul, your own soul is part of alam al-ghayb. So anything that is beyond the reach of ordinary human perception is called ghayb, unseen. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the believers as what? Alif Lam Meem, Thalik Al-Kitabu La Rayba Fihi Hudan Lil Muttaqeen. Allah describes the Muttaqeen. The first quality of the Muttaqeen is what? الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those who believe in the unseen, who believe that there are realities beyond the empirical data that we can collect through our five senses. They understand that what exists is beyond the reach of my senses. Now what's interesting about this ayah, and as many of you may know, this is the ayah that is uh, that we recite in the second rak'ah of Salat al ghufayla the first rak'ah wa dhannuni in dhahaba mughaliban and the next rak'ah we recite this ayah wa 'indahu mafatih al ghayb la ya'lamuha illa hu there are many verses in the quran that assert that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows the unseen that he's the only one with this inherent knowledge of the unseen. Every other creation, 
that possesses knowledge of the unseen is given knowledge of the unseen. It's acquired, as we mentioned last week. For example, if you go to Surah An Nam, Surah 27, verse 65, Allah in this ayah makes it very clear that He has knowledge of the unseen. No one in the heavens and the earth knows Al Ghayb knows the unseen except Allah. However, this is the only verse in the entire Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that He possesses not only knowledge of the unseen, but He possesses the keys to the unseen. He possesses what? Mafatihul Ghayb. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُوْ Miftah is the singular of mafatih. Miftah means key. The function of a key is to do what? It unlocks something and it gives you access to something that you don't have access to. So not only does Allah possess knowledge of the unseen, he also has the ability to give access to this knowledge. Now, now, the fact that Allah says He possesses the keys to the unseen, the implicit message is what? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create keys if He's only going to keep it with Himself? What's implicit here is that He gives access to some of this knowledge, to special servants. He shares these keys, which give access to the ghayb with certain gifted personalities. Now, this is one opinion. Now, what is the meaning of keys of the unseen? There is an opinion among some of the commentators that mafatihul al-ghayb, refers to five areas that are actually mentioned in the Qur'an. There are four types of knowledge where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exclusive knowledge of it. So there's a hadith that says that there, the keys of the unseen are five. And it's actually mentioned in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, verse 34. So if you go to Surah Luqman, verse 34, there's a hadith that we have that mentions these five things as مفاتح الغيب. Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ Surely Allah possesses knowledge of the hour. Here, knowledge of the hour means what? The, the timing of the day of judgment. وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْفِ Now your weatherman can tell you if it's going to rain tomorrow. And maybe 50% of the time, 80% of the time, they're also wrong. But even if they're right, is there any weatherman, is there any human being that can tell you how many droplets of water will fall from the sky? Is there any computer that we have to even calculate how many droplets of water will fall from the sky on a rainy day? Only Allah has this knowledge. In Allah عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ Number one. وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْفِ And He sends down the rain. This could be a reference to the apportioning of sustenance. Only Allah has knowledge of the exact sustenance that is to be given to each creature. Because water, according to some scholars, is a metaphor for rizq. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ Number three. And he knows what is in the womb. Now, with the advent of medicine and technology, you know, after five, six months, you can determine the gender of the fetus. And sometimes doctors are wrong. But before that, they don't know. When a woman becomes pregnant, in the first trimester, is there anyone that can tell what the gender is? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge of the gender of this child. Not only the gender, he knows all of the qualities and the characteristics. Even if a doctor can tell you that this is the gender, this is the blood type, can they tell you what type of personality they will have? Can they tell you this person is going to have a propensity towards anger? This person is going to be very gentle. This person is going to have this level of intelligence? We don't know. Only Allah knows the particulars of each human being. Allah knows what is growing in the womb. No soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. What it will earn could mean in sustenance. It could also mean what you will do. The, the, the spiritual provisions that you will gather the next day. No soul knows what it will acquire the next day. And no soul knows in which land it will die. No one knows exactly where is the spot on the earth that my soul is going to leave my body. Even if you know, for example, that I'm going to die in this city, do you know the exact pinpoint location where your soul, where your ruh is going to leave your body? You don't know. There are a lot of times someone faints. There are many cases where someone commits suicide, but they don't commit suicide in the same place that they wanted to die in. Maybe they, they slip their wrist, for example, and then they rush to the hospital and they die somewhere else. Only Allah knows the land, the place in which your soul will leave your body. In Allah, alimun khabir. So some ulama say, Mafatuhul ghayb refers to these five. Knowledge of the unseen, knowledge of the rain, the number of the droplets, the sustenance that has been apportioned to creatures. He's the one who knows what is in the wombs of the mothers. He is the only one who knows what will be earned by each human being the following day, whether it's materialistic or spiritual. And he is the only one who knows where every soul will, will depart in this world. So this is the first part of the ayah. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتُحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا That's the general rule of thumb. No one knows, has this knowledge but him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us. So this is ghayb. Then Allah speaks to us about how he knows all aspects of the seen reality as well. So he knows alam al ghayb and he also knows everything about the visible phenomena. And he knows what is on the land and what is in the sea. So again, land and sea, these are seeable, these are visible. He knows what is in the land and what is in the sea. And then in the next ayah, you may assume, and it seems that Allah is almost anticipating the question of the reader, that you may think, oh, he has general knowledge of what is on the earth and what is in the sea. Allah continues saying that, no, my knowledge is not general. It's particular. It's specific. Allah knows there is not a single leaf that falls from a tree, but Allah knows what tree it came from, how long it will take to fall on the earth, where it will fall, what creatures will consume this leaf, where the wind will blow it. Imagine, think of all of the trees on earth. At every single moment, how many leaves are falling from trees? Allah says, I know about each and every leaf. So his knowledge of even the smallest things serves as a warning to human beings that Allah is aware of all that we do. If Allah knows about every leaf that falls from the tree, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know about your intentions. He doesn't know about your motives. 
He doesn't know what you do behind closed doors. So his knowledge of even the smallest things, my dear brothers and sisters, serves as a reminder, as a warning to human beings that Allah is aware of all that we do, no matter how hidden or small that they are. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْمٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ All of this is in what? It's preserved in a clear record. Kitab al mubin there's a lengthy discussion among the ulama, but there are many ulama that say Kitab al mubin is a metaphor for Allah's knowledge. Because we human beings, especially in the past, knowledge used to be preserved in books. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of this is contained within Allah's knowledge. So here, Kitab al mubin is a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Ayah number 60, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ بِالنَّهَارِ ثُمَّ يَبْعَثُكُمْ فِيهِ لِيُقْضَى أَجَلٌ مُسَمَّى ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ And it is he who takes your souls by night and he knows what you commit by day then by day he resurrects you that a term appointed may be fulfilled then to him you shall return and he shall inform you of which you used to do the verb in this ayah is commonly used in the arabic language to refer to the death of a person this is why you know, we go to the masjid and we have, we we uh, we commemorate wafat. Comes from the word yatawafakum. Here, in this context, however, it refers to sleep. For in sleep, as in death, one's physical senses and limbs are rendered ineffective. This is the commonality between sleep and death. When you sleep. Your senses are suspended. Your physical senses and your limbs are ineffective in the same way that you don't have the ability to use your senses when you're, when you're dead. You lose all of these abilities. And only the inner senses and the movement of the soul continue. So these are, this is what is common between sleep and death. When you sleep, your physical senses and your limbs are ineffective. When you're dead, your physical senses and your limbs are also ineffective. What's the common denominator? The inner senses and the soul is still alive in both cases. The soul is still there. The soul, there's activity of the soul that is happening in the sleeping person and in the person who is dead. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, in ayah number 60 of Surah Al-An'am, He's drawing our attention to the analogous relationship between sleep and death and waking up and resurrection. If you go to Surah Al-Furqan, Surah 25, verse 47, again Allah alludes to this. He says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا he is the one who has made the night a covering for you. subata, And Allah has made sleep subata. Subata literally means to sever something, to cut something off. nushura, And He has made the day a time of resurrection for you. Every morning we experience resurrection now, you know there's a beautiful hadith that i was reading today from luqman luqman al-hakim luqman is mentioned in the quran there's a surah in the quran uh, named after uh, luqman luqman was a man of profound wisdom he was a man of deep insight the hadith says that he once said to his son again 
you know, highlighting highlighting the the relationship between sleep and death and waking up and resurrection. Luqman he says to his son, Ya Bunay, in takufi shakim min al maut farfa an nafsik al nom walan tastati adalik. Oh my son, if you ever have doubt about death. If you ever feel that is death really going to happen to me? Am I really going to die? Try to keep yourself from falling asleep. You can't. Sleep is like a gentle tyrant that overwhelms you. If you have any doubt about death, try to keep yourself from falling asleep. Farfa an nafsik an nom. You will never be able to. In the same way that your body gets overwhelmed by that feeling of fatigue, that sleep overtakes you, death will overtake you. وَإِن كُنْتَ فِي شَكٍ مِّنَ الْبَعْثِ فَرْفَعْ عَنْ نَفْسِكَ الْإِنْتِبَاهِ وَلَنْ تَسْتَطِيعَ ذَلِكَ Luqman, he says to his son, O oh my beloved son, and if you have doubt about resurrection, Try to avert yourself from waking up after you go to sleep. When you go to sleep, you automatically wake up. You can only sleep for so much. Eventually, you awaken. In the same way that you awaken after you sleep, you will awaken after your death. In the same way that you shouldn't have doubt about death. If you ever have doubt about death, remind yourself that in the same way that sleep overtakes me, death will overtake me. And in the same way I wake up every morning after that slumber, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed resurrect me. So likening sleep and waking to death and resurrection makes an implicit argument for the reality of resurrection on the basis of human experience. Now here the... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to prove resurrection to us through something that we experience every night, which is sleep. If Allah Azza wa Jal can withhold the ordinary waking consciousness in sleep, then return that consciousness to us and cause us to wake up every morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to withhold consciousness from us permanently through death and then cause us to wake up through resurrection now if you go to surat az zumar surah 39 verse 42 again this is an ayah where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about sleep as being a minor death that we experience Allah says, Allah yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha wal-lati lam tamut fi manamiha fayumsiku al-lati qadha alayha al-mawt wa yursilu al-ukhra ila ajalim musamma inna fi thalika la ayati liqawmi yatafakkaroon Allah causes the souls to die. Allah takes the souls when they die and the one that does not die in its sleep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it but he returns it if that soul does not die if that person does not die in his sleep the soul is returned so he can fulfill the appointed time period now a question that people have is when I sleep what happens to my soul does my soul depart my body? This question was actually posed to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi by Abu Basir. Abu Basir was a student, he was a disciple of the fifth and the sixth Imam. The hadith says, Al-Imam al-Sadiq indama sa'alahu Abu Basir. It's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq when Abu Basir asked him, عن الروح عند النوم أخارج من البدن أبو بصير asks the Imam, O Imam, when we sleep at night, 
Does the soul leave the body? Does the ruh leave the body? Is it external to it? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, قَالَ لَا يَا أَبَا بَصِيرُ O Abu Basir, the soul, the spirit does not leave the body when you sleep. إِذَا فَإِنَّ الرُّوحَ إِذَا فَارَقَتِ الْبَدَنِ لَمْ تَعُدْ إِلَيْهِ the Imam السلام, he says, Oh Abu Basir, if the ruh leaves the body, it will never come back to it. It seems that when there is when death takes place, it's completely finalized. There is no return. The Imam he explains. Because the ayah says that Allah takes the soul and if the person is meant to live on, the soul is returned. The Imam says, no, it doesn't mean that there's separation. The Imam says it's like the sun whose position is fixed in the sky, but its rays extend. So your ruh, it's kind of like the rays of the sun. It doesn't depart, it extends away from your physical body and that's why you're able to see these visions. So your soul doesn't depart the body, it's kind of like a semi-departure. In the same way that the rays of the sun can extend, but the sun itself is in one place. So in any case, the cycle of sleeping and waking also points to the vicissitudes of earthly life. You see, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives and He withholds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you sleep, when you awake, He gives you life. He restores your senses to you. When you sleep, Allah takes. This bust, as the the Urafa they say, and this qabd, Bust means to grant, to give, and qabd means to withhold. And this giving and this taking applies to physical realities and also spiritual realities. In our journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, in order to train us and to facilitate our journey to Him, He's always giving and taking. Because you have to experience the joy of receiving and also the bitterness of divine taking. Because in the, as the human being has to go through many stages, many spiritual stations. You know, if there's a book called Manazilus Sa'irin, the, station, the stations of the wayfarer. In this life, we're essentially on a journey towards Allah. There are many stations of development that we have to undergo. This book outlines 100 stations of spiritual wayfaring. The first is Babul Yaqwa, which is the station of awakening. The first step in your journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? That you have to wake up. Many of us are in a spiritual comatose. We have to awaken. And then, when you go through all of these stages, stage 100 is Tawheed. When you go through the stage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes He gives and sometimes He takes. Sometimes He gives you health, He takes it away from you. Sometimes he gives you certain spiritual abilities and then he takes it. So you go through these ups and downs. You experience these divine grantings and these divine withholdings and they're meant to build you and move you closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this verse about sleep and, and, and uh, being awake is a reminder of this concept of bus and qab. and then at the end of the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says if you go back to the to ayah number 60 
ثم ينبئكم بما كنتم تعملون when this journey ends when you meet Allah on the day of judgment Allah will inform you of what you used to do how does Allah inform us on the day of judgment one way as mentioned in the Quran is that our book of deeds is presented to us if you go to Surah Al-Kahf, Surah 18, verse 49. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابِ When the books are presented. فَتَرَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِي You'll find that the wrongdoers, the sinners, the criminals, they're very apprehensive about what is contained in that book when this book is shown to them they will say what kind of book is this where there is not a major thing or a minor thing but it is recorded in it and they will find everything that they did present in front of them. Now, there was a man who came to Imam al-Sadiq and we'll conclude here as we're running out of time. There was a man who came to the Imam and he says to the Imam, the Imam salam says to him, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ the Imam was telling, this it seemed like it was a teaching circle. The Imam was telling them that on the day of judgment, the books of A'mal will be given to each human being. One of the students of the Imam asks the Imam, and it will be said, the Imam tells, tells them that it will be said to each human being, read your book, iqra'u. So Al-Rawi, the one who's narrating this hadith, he says, I asked the Imam, ma fi? Will the human being remember everything that is in that book of deeds? Because right now, if I, if, I, if I was recording everything that you did in the past year, and I show it to you, many of the things that you will read, you won't even remember it. Most of us cannot remember what we ate yesterday for dinner. So the man is asking the Imam, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, are we going to remember all of the things that we did in life? Everything? The Imam says, Innahu yadhkuruhu. The Imam says, yes, you will remember everything. Thama min lahzatin, wala kalimatin, wala naqli qadamin, wala shay'in. The Imam السلام, says, You will remember everything when this book of A'mal is presented to you on the day of Qiyamah. You'll recall everything. The Imam says, Every moment you'll remember. Every word that you uttered, you will remember it vividly. You will remember every single step that you took in dunya, in your life. Every single footstep, you'll remember it. And there will not be a single thing that you did that you will not remember. And the Imam says that everything that you did, everything that is recorded, you will feel as though you have just done it. It won't even feel like something that you have to recall. It's as though you have, you've just done, you have just committed all of these actions in the last hour. It will be fresh in your mind. Every moment, every thought. Every footstep. فَلِذَلِكَ قَالُوا The Imam السلام, he says, this is why, no one on the Day of Judgment says, Ilahi, what is this? I don't remember this. No one has amnesia on the Day of Judgment. That's why the Imam says, the Imam says, this is why all people, though, especially the sinners, they will say, Yahweh letana, woe be unto us, because they remember everything. Ya waylatana ma li hadha al-kitab la yughadir sagiratan wa la kabira illa ahsa we ask Allah azza wa jalla to bless us and guide us and to illuminate our hearts and enlighten our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa ali Muhammad
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد If there are any questions or even comments, we can take them. We have a little bit of time. So, Malana, the issue of you know sleep and death is always very uh, interesting, intriguing for anyone, right? No. So, so the thing about when the um, which actually I didn't know this that the root basically stays in the body when you're sleeping. I thought it leaves, but. So if it's, it, but you said that uh, it kind of expands um, like the sun and that's why it has visions and you can see all that, but a lot of the visions, that's not what's happening out there. A lot so of the visions is, so is what? Who basically um, expands basically uh, and uh, has, that's why it has visions. But a lot of what you see in your dream, it's not exactly happening anywhere. So the rule could not have really seen it. A lot of what's happening in your dreams is not is what? It's not really happening. It hasn't happened. It's just an imagination. I mean, you're again when it, when it comes to dream interpretation, you know, I I personally cannot speak with any authority on the on you know what is the meaning of these visions that we see. But what what we do know is that there is there is activity within the soul within the ruh that is taking place at night. That in the same way that the rays of the the uh, sun emanate and they extend, the ruh seems to have this ability to extend beyond the limits of the body. Now, what does that exactly mean? Now, what does that mean with respect to the visions that we see? I don't know. And really, anyone, and this is why I always warn brothers and sisters that when it comes to dreams, it's it's actually it's problematic for anyone to speak with authority and with 100 percent certainty about the interpretation of dreams unless they're referring to the masumin where the imams are giving a general rule where for example if someone sees such and such thing this is the meaning in the quran the only one who really interprets dreams accurately are our prophets beyond that most of the dreams that we have don't really have meaning they may have meaning but again we don't know the meanings of these dreams and for someone to say that this is this is the meaning of your dream they have to allow all them responsible this is you're speaking without ilm and it's a, it's a sin to to speak and give and give and especially because people make they make life-changing decisions based on dreams unfortunately and therefore if if you're giving them a wrong interpretation and you're presenting it to them with conviction and certainty as though this is based on something that Ahlul Bayt have said, you'll be held responsible for misguiding this person, especially because you spoke without knowledge. So the extension of the soul in uh, while we're sleeping, I personally do not know how it's related to dreams and what that what, what exactly that entails. But according to the Imam, that there is definitely no departure, that there's the, the soul, the ruh, does not leave the body, as the Imam Ali Sallallahu explained. Well, and I have two questions. So, no. is, the, is the ruh like the sun, or is, or is the ruh like the rays of the sun? What was the exact hadith? The Imam Ali Sallallahu he says, I'll read it again. فَإِنَّ الرُّوحَ إِذَا فَارَقَتِ الْبَدَنَ بَدَنْ لَمْ تَعُدْ إِلَيْهِ The Imam says if the, the ruh leaves the body, it will not return. It's kind of like a bird. If you open up the bird cage and the bird flies out, chances are, because you've liberated it now, why would it prefer to be encased and limited and constricted when you've allowed it to fly? This is perhaps the sir, the secret as to why the ruh won't come back. Because you, it's like you've liberated a slave and then the slave is going to come back. It's not going to happen. And then the imam says, 
غير. He gives an example just to bring because again, the ruh is something that's really beyond our comprehension. The Imam is giving us an example to uh, to make it more understandable to us. He says غير أنها بمنزلة عين الشمس. He says the, the ruh is like the sun. He says it's like the sun. It's fixed when you're sleeping, meaning it has not left your body, but it's. It extends. So it's like the sun that is fixed. Markuzatun Fisama, it's fixed in the sky. Fi kabidiha wa shu'a'uha fi dunya. It ex the rays give it that uh, that extension. It can reach many places, not because the sun is going to that place, but because the rays of the sun are extending. Is it clear? Yeah, thank you. And uh, the second question was, what is the book that you are yeah. um, referring to? In this? Uh, is, it in, is it in English or just in Arabic? Which book? About the one about spiritual... Um, the one that has a hadith from Imam Jafar Sahib. Oh, the one that... This is my, this is my notebook. Okay. <laughs> oh. but then, are you talking about Manazir al-Sa'irin or you're talking about the hadith that I mentioned? The hadith that you mentioned. What was the source? Like, what the source, was alhamdulillah, we have the blessing of apps. I'll look it up for you right now. This one is in Jami' al-Akhbar. It's not in Bihar. Okay. So it, it might be, but 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 uh, the source that I have is Jami' al-Akhbar. Thank you. And I, I don't I don't think it's in uh, in English. Uh, Sheikh, um, you talked about uh, Bayana, like that clear evidence. Uh, does it also share room with bayat? Like when you someone's giving your bayat, or is that a different word? No, that's a totally different word. Yeah, because yeah, bayah has an ayn in it. This has there's no ayn in bayina. This is just uh, ayat with a shadda on it. Bayina. Gotcha. And also uh, on the five keys to the unseen, uh, mm. it feels like that's kind of a the, the list mentioned in the other verse where seem like very normal things other than Qiyamah. It like, seems like it's an, kind of an incomplete list because it didn't include things like Jannat, Angels, other unseen lists you even mentioned for that. Yeah, w which is why it's not my favorite interpretation. You know, I, I was just sharing with you one one view that, uh, that some scholars have. But uh, I have not seen that this is a view that's supported by... Uh, by the uh, traditions of Ahlul Bayt. It's an opinion, you know, it's, and it's, all, it's good, you know, especially when we're studying Quran, it's good to get exposure to the discussions uh, even among non-Shia scholars, you know, what they say about uh, these verses. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, this, this is, uh, some of the ulama have said this is the meaning of Mafatu al ghaib But is your question about the verse itself from uh, Surah 31? Well, it's really about like then what is uh, meant by the keys to the unseen, or what are the keys that could be? What what is meant by mafatu uh, al Yeah. Are you talking about those the list of those five things? Well, that was like kind of one example of what the key that, is. that was one part. That was one. That was one uh, interpretation There's of what is meant by the uh, the keys mafatu al ghayb some scholars have said it's, it means these five things mentioned in Surah Luqman. Now, other scholars say that no, what it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Mafatuhul Ghayb, means that He is the one who has, doesn't only have knowledge of the unseen, but He is the one who possesses access. He has the access to that knowledge of the unseen. So if He wishes to allow, someone to access that knowledge, he's the one who has the keys, meaning he is the one who has inherent knowledge of the unseen. But I think this is very interesting because it is a complete life cycle for human. If you look at it, it talks about the womb, it talks about birth, it talks about death, it talks about sustainers, it talks about you don't know what's happening tomorrow, and it talks about the day of judgment, it talks about the entire human cycle. And I thought it was very, very interesting just these for and neither for jannat and all. I mean that doesn't affect us directly, I and mean, we don't need them. But but but, but even go, going back to uh, uh, Zain's question, al the, the the hour. I would say that that encompasses you know jannah and nar because the day of judgment. I mean that's 
that's essentially the the result and the the ending of the day, day of judgment. It's either hellfire or uh, or paradise. So al Musa'a would encompass uh, potentially could encompass paradise and hellfire. Thank you. Also, yeah, uh, Brother Mohsen asked some questions on the chat. Okay. Well. So the question is, you mentioned that the first step in our journey to Allah is to awaken. Can you please elaborate? Is that just the condition of realizing that we need to seek Allah or is it more than that? So the first uh, the first step, and inshallah, I really pray that maybe in the future we can actually uh, conduct uh, a class on uh, on what I would call you know practical arfan, you know, speaking about uh, about spirituality because this is really the kernel of of Islam. This is the essence of Islam: is developing the soul to skiyat to nafs. So the first station is babul yaqwa. You know. When we say that the first stage is to to awaken, is to be awake, obviously, you know, every morning we wake up. Biologically, we're all alive, we're awake, we're aware of our surroundings. But many of us, we don't live with purpose. We have not revived our spirituality. We, we live in such, we, we have a very mechanical, robotic lifestyle. We don't have a clear understanding of our point of origin, of our purpose, and of our destination. So waking up is basically realizing and coming to terms with the, the reality that there's a, you have a sense of urgency, that you are only alive in this, in this life for a fixed number of time, and how you live your life is going to determine your eternity. So based on that, you have to understand the gravity of the trial that you are undergoing, that you're experiencing. So waking up is basically understanding that I have a purpose, I was created for a high purpose, I have a, a destination, I have a direction, and I have to kind of begin moving towards that, uh, that direction. Understanding that you're not, that you have that your pursuits need to be more noble than the pursuits of other uh, other creatures. And inshallah, when we do take uh, a class on uh, on uh, spirituality, we can speak in more detail about that. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah that would be really yeah, nice. Yeah, we're all really yeah, into we'll let's learning do it. about it. Yeah. That, that was really good. Inshallah, inshallah, hopefully one day we will, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, well, inshallah, yeah. Inshallah. Any questions? Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Shaykh. Yeah. It's been a Thank pleasure you. and a blessing. Thank you so much. And uh, inshallah, I look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. By the way, if any of you have questions during the week, I know sometimes you might have a question that comes to your mind Please feel free to email me, and uh, inshallah, hopefully, I can be of uh, of assistance. Thank you very much. Inshallah, keep me in your du'a, and uh, inshallah, I'll see you guys next week. All right, inshallah, inshallah. see you then.